Good evening everyone, Late Night Mega here, and tonight we're playing Blue Black Control. Now, I, I had some initial challenges with building a Blue Black Control. Blue Black is technically my favorite two color combination in Magic, but uh, when it comes to Modern, there's always a couple questions. Like if we're going to play a Blue Black Control just focused on, you know, spot removal, mass removal, counters, and card draw, we have to wonder, well, why not play blue-white? Because white gives you Path to Exile and Supreme Verdict, and that's better than what black can do. Uh, or why not just splash white for those things? And the other question is, well, why not splash red and get, like, lightning bolts and terminates and Colgan's commands and all that sort of stuff? And so blue-black control kind of has a little bit of an identity crisis in modern, uh, in my opinion. So I set out with this deck trying to do something that, you know, uh, couldn't be done by those color combinations. And this was also an attempt at uh, an anti-tron deck. As you can see, we have uh, main deck surgical extractions, and I'm going to go down here. We have four main deck ghost quarters. So the idea being to ghost quarter a tron land and surgical extract it keeping them off of Tron permanently, and this is in the main deck. So, uh, what else What else did I do uh, for this deck? Well, since we're running four Ghost Quarters, obviously we're going to have four Shadow of Doubts here. Seems like a natural fit. And combine that with uh, Inquisition of Kozilek, and we have a nice package for this uh, non-board disruption. It, it doesn't disrupt like creatures and stuff that have hit the board, but it, there's a lot of hand disruption, deck disruption, you know, just, just kind of, you know, just kind of things you might expect from blue-black. And uh, so the, the deck became kind of interesting. You know, we have all these cheap cards, and then I went and added some Serum Visions, some Disfigures for early removal, and uh, some cheap counter spells. And the idea behind this was to, uh, you know, all these one-mana spells that we're playing is going to fill up our graveyard pretty quickly for a uh, cheap Tassiger on turn three or four. And fetch lands also help with that. And uh, then we can also protect him with Stubborn Denial. Stubborn Denial suddenly becomes a one-mana negate when we have a creature with power four or greater. So that's kind of where this uh, deck was starting to uh, take shape. And then for some other threats, you know, we have Grave Titan. He's an old favorite from uh, Cruel Ultimatum. We have Tombstalker. This was originally a Phyrexian Obliterator, and I had a little bit more heavy on the uh, black mana, but I found this deck weak to flyers, and I was thinking that this would help. And, uh, well, it helps, but very little. Uh, but it also gives us another Delve guy, too. So that, that can be useful. Then we've got our four Cryptic Commands, uh, a couple Languish. Uh, just a kind of a side note, these Languishes weren't actually in the main board, they were in the sideboard, uh, and there were three of them in the board. But I have them here, well, for, for a specific reason we'll get to later. These were originally Engineered Explosives in the main board. But we'll get to that in a bit. And uh, a batter skull as well, even though there's a little bit of a conflict between that and the languish, batter skull does still turn on the stubborn denials, and we can also buy it back. And it gives us uh, it gives the deck some nice life link. And so uh, yeah, th this deck also almost became a super friends list. I did have an obnixilis in here. Uh, I had a Jason Raveler of Secrets in here, so I had a couple Planeswalkers going in and out. I did have, I actually had a lot of things going in and out of this deck. Uh, this did, deck did not do too well for several reasons, although, though it did great the first couple of weeks I used it, which this list uh, for the main deck is uh, the closest to the uh, list I was using. But it also had some issues, like these mana leaks were originally remands, the idea being, you know, I could remand something and inquisition it, or just wait until, uh, dig deeper into my deck and 
looking for an answer that I need. Uh, only the issue was the answer is not simply there. You just have a bunch of, you know, surgicals and inquisitions and shadow of doubts that you don't really want to be drawing later on in the game. So this deck has a ton of one drops and it felt very strong in the early turns but it kind of pittered out as the game goes on. And one other thing I want to talk about as far as the Surgical goes, uh, yes, Surgical was primarily in the main deck for the Tron matchup. However, I don't just throw uh, cards like this in the main deck without thinking of applications that they have in other decks. And there are some interesting applications for main deck Surgicals. You know, any deck that's trying to use the graveyard in any way, you know, main deck surgicals you're gonna like having those even decks uh, that just use the graveyard a little bit like uh, your opponents using snapcaster mage surgical is pretty good there another uh, thing I would like to use is like inquisition a path to exile or something on their, de uh, their hand or or stubborn denial path to exile since a lot of these creatures like grave titan tasker tombstalker they're pretty weak to path to exile so we get their first path out of their hand and then surgical extraction it and they can no longer path our creatures. And this all sounds really good on paper in practicata practic I can't even talk. In all practicality, it did not always work out that well. And that was kind of unfortunate. The surgical extractions in the end kind of became like a uh, a cute trick, but doesn't really go anywhere. You know, I designed this to be kind of an anti-Tron deck, and while this did do a wonderful job of keeping Tron off of their Tron permanently and completely, it didn't have a lot of follow-up to put pressure on the opponent. By the time I did, you know, they, they would be able to start dropping their own cards, at which point I would be able, I'd be like tapping out for a Grave Tight, and they're like, okay, I tap out for uh, a worm coil engine, which you can't counter since you had to tap out for your Grave Titan. Things like that. And so, even taking them off of Tron, I still ended up losing against Tron decks about half the time. So it didn't really succeed in one of its initial goals. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the sideboard before we get there, th this deck overall, it wasn't super great. There were a lot of things going in and out of this deck, and I, you'll see that I have 27 cards here in the sideboard. I did not actually run a 27-card sideboard, just for the record, uh, but I threw a bunch of cards in there just to kind of show some of the cards that were going in and out of the deck and the sideboard, what I liked, what I didn't like. Overall, I would say this deck was kind of a big failure. Uh, but I'm going to show this off anyways because this is part of the modern journey that I'm on. This this journey through the modern format. This is one of the decks that I have tried out, and so for that reason, it's it's worth including. And I've learned I learned quite a bit from this, and discovered some new things as well. So uh, let's with that in mind, let's go into the sideboard. And you'll see a whole bunch of stuff. These are things that uh, were going in and out of the deck. I think one of the only constants was uh, the Tassiger as far as finishers. You know, I tried Thing in the Ice because, you know, when that flips, it becomes a 7-8. Uh, but it became quite challenging to flip when you start drawing them in the mid to late game. And that was one of the issues I had with this deck is the lack of, like, mass card draw or something along those lines, and and I mean, with the other issues the deck has uh, against like any sort of resolved creatures or multiple resolved creatures, you know, I didn't I didn't feel like it was worth it to keep uh, trying to put effort into this. I also tried out some plume veils. Uh, now I did change the uh, mana base around a bit. I did have Vidalcan Shackles going in and out of this deck as well. I had it as like a three or a four of. And uh, the way I reworked the mana base for that is I took out the uh, Drowned Catacombs and all but one of the swamps, put in another Sunken Hollow and more islands. And uh, it ran pretty smoothly as far as, you know, color and island count and all that. 
But with Vidalgan and Shackles, I just found that it was it was slow at answering creatures. Uh, Plume Veil, you know, they were kind of nice, but you had to be able to play it on turn three uh, in order to get a good effect with it. And ideally, you might want to play it for when you have four blue, so you can also cast it with Stubborn Denial. It also turns on Stubborn Denial. And I was also using the Plume Veil to protect Ashiok, which is another finisher uh, that I tried using in place of those bigger guys. Tried to lower the the cost of the finishers, thinking that might help. But uh, it just turned into not really being able to close out a game. Uh, other cards, Tribute to Hunger in the sideboard, you know, Sacrifice Effect, fairly standard. I had some Dispels and some Duresses. Uh, the Duresses were kind of in and out of the sideboard, but uh, once again, more one-mana cards to add to uh, our Delve count here. And I had, I had three Languish in the sideboard, so that's why there's a, a Languish hanging out here. Curse of Death's Hold, this was quite interesting against some aggro decks, uh, like Affinity, Infect, as long as you can survive to, to reach 5 mana and you resolve this, uh, things look really good for you. I also had more creature removal because I'm not oblivious to <laughs> the main deck's lack of creature removal, so I had uh, several Smothers and Doom Blades. I mean, at one point, I think there were at least nine cards or more that killed creatures. One of the constants, though, throughout the sideboard was Echoing Truth. I had these as a two of, and I was super impressed by it. You're able to sweep away tokens, you're able to sweep away uh, enchantments or, or permanents that you don't like. I mean, this deck had a uh, very strong matchup against a uh, Boggles deck because I had Echoing Truth that could bounce an enchantment and then allow Tasker to block the creature because their spirit mantle's back in their hand or uh, or bounce their uh, ley line of sanctities so now I can start using Tribute to Hunger on them uh, and Languish, giving creatures minus four, minus four instead of destroying them like the $60 damnations that I don't own. But uh, the Languish got through the Umbras as well. The Umbras would not protect against Languish. So it, there was a lot of interesting little things like that that, that helped put this deck over in, in some matchups. But overall, uh, not super good. One other thing I did pull out of this was... Uh, you know, one of my other friends, he was running control decks as well, and he had this interesting package in the sideboard. He would have a trinket mage followed up by some one mana uh, or less searchable artifacts like engineered explosives, hangerback walker, pithing needle, and then uh, either, well, Nihil Spellbomb for me because I've got black, or uh, Relic of Progenitus. And that's something I thought wow, that's kind of interesting, you know, being able to tutor those cards. Instead of having to run two of each in the sideboard, you could just run uh, one of each and then also be able to tutor for them. Uh, I did end up running the two on the Engineered Explosives because in the matchups where you want it, you really want it. And, and I'm starting to go back to uh, two of the Mass Graveyard instead of just having the one in the Trinket Mage. To search for it because again in the matchups where you want it you might really want it like against dredge or living end and you might end up needing more than one of them uh, yeah being able to tutor for those is quite interesting and so this is kind of a sideboard package that i've used in well a lot of my other control decks since since this point and so we're going to be seeing this concept again with the Trinket Mage, Engineered Explosives, not so much the Hangerback Walker. Hangerback Walker was kind of there uh, to be against Affinity, and is another alternate finisher against Control. You know, if the Control deck wasn't running Path, or uh, they had their Path to Exiles all surgical, Hangerback Walker could pose quite an issue for them. So that's, that's where I... That's where that came in. Uh, not all of the decks I've been running have been running hanger back in the side, just because I do have other ways to finish out a game. Uh, 
I don't feel the hanger back is needed, but uh, it might still be decent to throw in there if you got the space. So what happened with this deck? You know, I had a couple strong showings, you know, because I'm doing all this new wacky stuff with Surgicals in the main deck and Shadow of Doubt in the main deck and all this. When you're able to uh, heavily disrupt your opponent with these, and the disruption is you know successful against the deck that you're up against, you know this deck's going to look pretty good. But against a deck that's just uh, sitting there throwing creatures out and doesn't care too much about Shadow of Doubt, doesn't care too much about Surgicals, uh, and develops a board presence, you're going to be sitting there wishing you brought another deck. So, yeah. It, I think the the last night I played this deck, I had I went uh, zero three and one, and it, w it was just awful, worse than any record I had with uh, Esper Drago Control, and you, you guys know how much I've liked to rag on that deck. So, uh, what do I do though after having a failure like this? I mean, granted, we I, I did learn some stuff through this. I did. Uh, I did take away this this nice trinket mage sideboard plan, and but but where do I go from here? And typically, what I do this is where I'll talk a bit about deck building in modern, and uh, some of the challenge it is challenges I have in building a new deck. You know, I, I have a failure like this, and what I the first thing I usually do is I run back to one of my uh, successful control decks, whether it's Tron or Cruel Ultimatum or or the Shadow of Doubt deck, and I'll play that deck again for a while. And that's where one of the deck building challenges comes in: is why should I take a risk building some new deck uh, like this and have it be a total flop when I already have several established control decks that do very well at any basically any given point all I have to do is uh, sleeve them up and off I go don't don't have to put any more effort into uh, deck building and such so why should I risk doing that when you know I have these other decks and they're not gonna rotate and so that's one of the challenges I've had to face as a deck builder uh, throughout this uh, whole thing. And, you know, we I always say that oh, modern's nice for deck building because, you know, your decks don't rotate. Uh, you know, you can really take your time and fine-tune a deck and uh, try that out and, and just get the deck to where you want it to be and then leave it and then go work on something else. And, like, there's no rush. You don't have to worry about you know, the format completely changing. You know, you might see some new decks crop up. You might see uh, some new cards make a splash in, in existing decks. That's usually what happens. But overall, the decks that you have will still be more or less uh, as effective as they were, aside from any cards getting banned or whatnot. But that's a whole other topic. So, yeah, I, I have a hard time kind of building other decks because you know I, I take my time and all that and I really thought that this was going to be you know kind of the end of this journey and I'm just like after this deck I was like I'm not going to build any more new decks uh, I will give you a little bit of a spoiler alert that's not the case I do have some new a few new decks to come down the stream but right now in our timeline we're about uh probably midsummer of 2016 so we're catching up to the current time so that's why I've kind of been slowing down on these videos uh, just because well you know pretty soon I'm not gonna have new stuff to add I'm not uh, not able to play and build and test and refine decks uh, every single week you know it, it, it's a process but it's a process I do enjoy. I do still like trying out new deck ideas, and so you will see some new things coming down the pipeline. Uh, but speaking of my established decks, the next deck I'm going to play, uh, it takes the template from one of the previous decks. The successful ones, not, not this one. So we'll have that to look forward to. 
and some other interesting uh, things are still to come. So yeah, sometimes, you know, uh, that's kind of part of deck building. Sometimes you might hit a home run, like with five color control, or or just guy tokens or bust, or uh, the, sh the blue white shadow of doubt deck, not the shadow of doubt deck, and have something that's a big hit, super successful for you. And sometimes you might get a complete flop like this, and that's just kind of the way it goes sometimes. But uh, you know, I always look. I always look and learn stuff from the failures, learn why it didn't work out, and take that into the future uh, and learn from this deck building experience. And so hopefully we can do better next time. So uh, until then, this is Late Night Mega. Good night, everyone.